Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started. Welcome to another year of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture <coughs> Speaker Series. Um, happy to have everybody back and welcome people who are new. We meet every week of the academic year at this time in this room. And the list of speakers for the year is up on the webpage. Pretty much the whole year's worth is up there now. Um, but I'm going to give you a little preview of what's coming up in the next few weeks before introducing today's speaker. Um, we normally also have thank yous on the first week where we talk about um, all the generous people who are funding back. We're still getting that list formulated, so I will do that in a future week. Um, but we have coming up, oh my gosh, I should have my reading glasses. Um, next week, uh, Michael Rascorla uh, from UCLA is coming. He's going to be talking about foundations of cognitive science and mental representation. The following week, Sarah Benson Amron is coming from the University of Wyoming, talking about individual, social, and ecological influences on problem solving abilities. Um, the following week is still TBA, um, but October 29th, um, Ben Benishek is coming from UNLV. And um, the following week, November 5th, is uh, Susan uh, Schaffnit from UCSB talking about child marriage. So that gets you through the next month or so of talks. You can see the complete list up there. I'm very happy today to introduce um, Elizabeth Trast. Um, yeah, you know, Crastle. Crastle. <laughs> it's hard. It's a hard one. Times before the talk. Um, <laughs> despite my butchering her name, I'm sure it's going to be a flawless talk. Um, she's from UCSB, um, the Department of Geography, and is going to be talking about spatial navigation. It's a welcome part. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here on the first uh, for the first talk of the year. Um, and kicking off the series. So yeah, I'm maybe a slightly unusual speaker for your series, I'm not sure, but um, so feel free to, you know, I'm going to be talking about some like brain stuff, so I'm going to hopefully explain it to you. Um, but if you have questions, I know this might not be everyone's background, so um, please, you know, feel free to to ask some clarifying questions. And then I think we have a lot of discussion time at the end as well. Um, and if you can't hear me, um, let me know, because I, I sometimes get quiet, but I'm working on it. <laughs> All right, so thanks for having me here. It's great to be here. Um, let me tell you a little bit about navigation and what I study and why I study uh, study navigation. So you know, when we think about this question about why we study navigation, we think maybe from an evolutionary perspective. Um, you know, early humans needed to find and remember locations of resources and avoid dangerous locations. Um, but you know we're modern humans, so we totally have lots of tools to help us, right? But if you know if you've used a GPS system, you know that they maybe don't make a lot of sense with how our brains actually work and how we actually think about things. And we certainly have a lot of confusing street signs out there. So um, just because we have tools doesn't mean they're actually helpful or they actually work in a way that we can actually understand them. Um, navigation is also important uh, for a lot of reasons um, as it relates to human health. So um, most notably because of Alzheimer's disease, um, but a lot of other mental disorders too um, have disorientation symptoms. So one of the first uh, symptoms of Alzheimer's is you get lost or wandering in these types of behaviors. Um, and so actually navigation could be an early um, detection signal for um, Alzheimer's. Um, so this is a, a visual of an Alzheimer's brain, as you can see it's severely, um, uh, there's a lot of atrophy. Um, and then as I go through today, I'm going to talk a lot about individual differences. And so when we um, think about individual differences, we can also think about things like um, personalized treatments um, and personalized medicine or thinking about how um, each person might differ in their sort of abilities and thinking about then how that might relate to um, our, our abilities to sort of target health treatments for them. And then from a sort of scientific perspective, for myself, I find navigation really interesting because it's it draws on a lot of different aspects of cognition, um, sort of perception, memory, um, attention, executive functioning, sort of the whole thing. So. Um, um, it's just a really interesting puzzle. Navigation isn't like a singular entity, so I find it really fascinating to figure out how these systems are all working together. Okay, so my approach um, has sort of two main parts to it too. So I have the sort of cognitive side with a lot of theory um, and a lot of behavior, and so we do a couple of things. We test people in virtual environments, so we make a lot of virtual environments uh, where people either actually physically walk around in them, sometimes they're on a desktop, 
um, but we do have walking facilities so that people actually can walk around in these virtual environments with a helmet. Um, and real environments too, so we can actually um, test people's real, real life navigation abilities or people, the routes people take, things like that. Um, from the neuroscience side, um, this is the sort of the other main tradition that people have been using is looking at the brain and how the brain works. Um, so not to go into too many details, this is the hippocampus. It's one of the major um, areas for navigation and also memory in general. Um, it's this sort of oblong little thing. Um, it's a very ancient structure. Um, lots of you know, mammals have this, um, this structure, so we can look at it in rodents, and that's why it's very nice um, uh, for a lot of the um, single cell recordings. And we can not look at not just where places in the brain are active, but maybe how they're active. So we can look at sort of models, like if you're traveling a distance, does it like just, is there increasing activity as you go forward? Um, does it increase and decrease as you approach a target? So there might be different ways of modeling these behaviors. Um, we can also look at whether or not two brain areas are uh, correlated over time. Um, and we call that functionally connected if they're correlated. Um, and so um, we can look at not just where things are happening, but how and how things are happening in a system or a network. Um, and so um, lots of different um, actions there. And so um, throughout this talk, I'm going to introduce you to sort of ideas both from the cognitive side and from the neuroscience side. So I tend to bridge these two things, um, these two aspects pretty evenly. So thinking about spatial knowledge, like what do we know about the world? Um, but then what is the information out there, both either in the environment or what's the information that we're gathering from our own systems? Um, and then what are the sort of cognitive processes that, under that support that? And then what's the neuroscience underneath that? So kind of looking at multiple levels here. So of course, the tools I use for these um, questions actually depend on the, the particular questions, whether I focus more on the cognitive side or the neuroscience side um, is really related to the questions that I ask. Um, and so what we're going to talk about today um, is what, first, what is the structure of spatial, spatial knowledge? So often people assume that it's a map. That's probably not true. We'll talk about different possibilities and then um, what it might be. Um, how do we learn new environments? So when we go to a new place, how do we learn a new city? How do we learn a new um, town or region? Um, I'm going to talk about active learning and what that might mean. Um, and then how does the brain track uh, movement? So if you're doing self-motion, if you're walking around, especially in a place that doesn't have a lot of landmarks, how do we actually track our, our movement? And this might be something that's very important for many of you who study people who, um, who are in sort of very dense forest or other types of environments that don't have a lot of information. Um, how are people tracking their own motion? Um, and related to this, then, what is the visual information and body-based information uh, for human path integration? Um, I'm also going to wrap up here, then, throughout, I talk about how individuals differ in their spatial abilities. Um, so that's going to be sort of a common thread that we're going to see throughout, because some people, you know, as you know, are <laughs> terrible. Some people are great. You don't have to identify yourself if you're terrible. You know who you are. Um, and uh, why that might be, but then maybe how we can help people who don't have great spatial abilities. Um, and I'm going to wrap up with a, uh, with a study that might be of interest to some of you, um, looking at sort of sex differences in navigation and thinking about sex hormones and an aging process um, that we're just getting started with. I'll tell you about that. Um, and then, of course, how does the brain process spatial information? We'll do that throughout as well. OK, so let's first talk about the structural spatial knowledge. As I said, um, often there's this common assumption going back um, many years about a cognitive map that we really have something like a map in our head. Um, that's probably not true. Um, but what is really the structure of spatial knowledge? So um, I'm going to walk you through some ideas um, of our structure of spatial knowledge. So there's several candidates here. So we have landmarks, um, which are salient objects or locations that just provide navigational cues. Um, and they can be a variety of things, right? So your library on campus, bear statue, um, things that are, you know, people know, have common knowledge about, and they can make navigational choices about. Um, they can also be something more mundane, like the McDonald's on the corner. Um, I lived in Rhode Island for many years, and people say things like, where the Shell Station used to be, right? So it requires you to have lived there for a long time and know where that was. Um, but people actually do very well because they have lived there a long time. So um, that's sort of the basics, and this builds up from there. Um, we also have root knowledge, which is a series of pla place action associations. Um, so just you know, where do you turn left? Where do you turn right? These are usually at landmarks. So my favorite example of this um, is one time when I was in high school. My sister and I went to visit my grandmother, who lived about an hour and a half away. And this was before GPS systems. We didn't even have a map. 
Um, but all we knew is once we get off the highway, we turn left at the stop, a stoplight at the top of the hill, we turn right at the vegetable stand, turn, go to the school, turn right again, cross the train tracks, and there we're at grandma's house. So our, my, our mother clearly had a lot of faith in us uh, to let us just go out there, but um, you know, if we had gotten lost on one of these, we would have been really lost because we didn't know where anything else was. We just knew where to turn at each landmark, or if one of those landmarks disappeared, we might have been in real trouble. Um, but um, again, we had those place action associations to get us where we needed to go. We also have graph knowledge. Um, this is something a little bit more than root knowledge. Um, so it's a network of place nodes linked by path edges. So this is sort of the connection between places and sort of the, the rows, perhaps, that might connect them. Um, so just as an example, these are actually the same graph um, because the connections are the same. So these are connected in the same way. Um, but you'll notice that they have different, uh, you know, the, the angles between them are different. The, the distances are, are different, but it's the topology is the same. So how things are connected um, uh, is what matters. It doesn't really matter if you have the exact distances or angles, uh, but you just know where to turn. So this might be something like, you know, you're driving down you know, Sunset Boulevard or something, and you just know you go for kind of a while, and you turn left here, but you don't really know if that, is that a mile, is that two miles? It doesn't necessarily matter. You just sort of know how far you, you just kind of go, go distance, and this takes you to the place you want to go. Um, and so um, it's a little more fluid um, uh, than something more like a map. Um, but it has more information than routes, because if you needed to take a detour, if this was suddenly blocked off, you would know how to get around it. Um, so a classic uh, uh, graph is something like a subway map, right? So again, you don't necessarily need to know all of the, the um, distances and angles. And in fact, they simplify it for you. So there's lots of twists and turns. And these stops are not all evenly spaced. Um, but they do that for you for simplifi simplification. All you need to know is where to change, basically. Um, there's something a little bit, another little complication on that. You can add some metric information. So you could do something like, you know, regularize something. So this is like, think this is 90 degrees. It's obviously not quite, um, but it's close enough. You could say, oh, these are maybe 45. You can have some relative distances and angles. So it's coarse, but maybe not, um, but not perfect. Um, it contains some biases and things like that. So you have some evidence, which I'm not going to tell you about today, um, but I can happy to talk about if we want it in the questions. Um, some evidence that, in fact, um, this is the most likely type of spatial knowledge is something like a labeled graph. Um, we don't necessarily just follow roots all the time. Um, but we also probably don't do something um, more than that. So the something more would be something like survey knowledge, which is really this map-like knowledge of um, metric distances and angles between locations. So this is Santa Barbara. Oops, I should have put UCLA here. Um, so you can really take a map of you know, things. You can make a straight shortcut between um, one place and another. Um, without having to go through the highway. So you could go from here to here, rather than taking the roads down. You can know how to get um, directly from one place to another and take shortcuts. So this is really something like um, you know, putting something in a Cartesian grid and knowing really where things are. And so it's a common coordinate system, so you can take these shortcuts. Um, and so um, one of the things I've done is sort of think about the different types of spatial knowledge and um, the relationship between cognitive processes that might underlie those types of spatial knowledge. Um, so for everything, we have to know things like where we are. We have to be able to recognize our place, our location, um, just from you know, seeing what we see in front of us. Um, but we have to be able to do different things with that information. So you know, if we're, gonna, if we're just doing a route, we might just need to know how to do response learning, turn left here, turn right there. Um, and might not need something more complicated. But if we're trying to do something maybe like a graph, um, we actually need to be able to relate goals to each other um, and maybe transform between different perspectives in different ways. Um, and then for survey knowledge, we really have to be able to do something like path integration, where we get that metric information from distances and angles about uh, between locations. I'm going to talk a little bit more about path integration in a little bit, so um, don't worry if you don't understand it right now. Um, so. Um, just sort of thinking about this, right? There's, it's really a complicated system. There's not just one type of spatial knowledge that's out there. It's not necessarily a singular system. Um, but we want to we want to understand a little bit more about how these different processes map on. How does the brain work and do those things? Because we need to have a lot of understanding about sort of how these systems all interact to get us where we need to go. So if we're thinking about learning new environments, um, 
we want to think about particularly how active navigation contributes navigation contributes to spatial learning. So when we looked at that um, cognitive processes, um, it might differ depending on the type of spatial knowledge that we're trying to learn. So if we're trying to learn um, something like a graph, we might need particular things that are active. And if we're trying to learn surveys, we might need to do other things um, to help us al along. So I'm going to focus in on one particular type of spatial knowledge, um, of the graph knowledge, um, here, although we've looked at others um, as well. Um, but first, I want to talk a little bit about what is active and what does that mean. Uh, because it can mean a lot of things. So there's sort of physical activity. Um, which is things like proprioception, so um, your bones and muscles moving around, and vestibular information from your inner ear, um, as well as the, the motor commands um, from your body. I'm going to talk about these a little more later. Um, there's also cognitive activity, um, which means things like allocation of attention, right? What are you paying attention to in the environment? Are you making decisions about where you want to go? Are you thinking about where you want to explore next and maybe what will be there? You're just kind of like following someone else, like being a passenger in a car. Uh, maybe something like mental manipulation of spatial information. So knowing you know, which one of these is the same as this, just rotated. right? So how can you do that sort of mental manipulation? From a navigation perspective, it might be things like knowing when you're um, going one way down a street and you see a firehouse um, first on the right and then a bank. If you come the other way, now th those things are going to be on your left and you'll come to the bank first and then the firehouse, right? So being able to take that sort of other perspective might be part of what we're, we're talking about here. Um, so I'm going to focus on um, maze learning. And so here's the, the maze that we did. Um, so this is a virtual maze. So it's in this big empty room. So again, people were walking around um, with a headset on and they could actually move around in this, in this maze. This is what it looks like from the first person perspective. There's some paintings on the, hall, on the walls. Um, that's what these red marks are. Um, there were several objects in the maze. So this is the well. Um, they were all in these little alcoves. And so um, we let people walk around for 10 minutes under different conditions. And I'm going to explain them in just a second. Um, and then we tested their knowledge. And so we tested their knowledge based on a, on a uh, shortest route task. Actually, I'll, I'll first I'll tell you what their conditions are. So we had them do two different things. So either when they were exploring, they could walk around and learn and just were free to explore wherever they want. We said, just find all the objects and learn their locations. You have 10 minutes. And so they could do that. Or we took them on a path. So we took them by the elbow and said, we're going to take you by to all the objects. Um, please learn their locations. Um, but we're just going to take you around from place to place. And so they would be matched with the person who was active. So everyone was matched to somebody else. So they all saw the same types of information. So it wasn't just the case that we had a set route for the passive group. Um, but now they just couldn't decide where they wanted to go. So we had them um, basically taking away this decision-making component. Um, because in our theory, based on our graph learning, um, we suspected that sort of making these predictions about where you wanted to go, sort of saying, making decisions about what you think you're going to see um, when you turn left, saying, oh, I want to explore this area because I don't know that much about it, um, will really help you learn something. Versus if you're just sort of passively following, um, that's going to prevent you learning those connections between the paths. Excuse me. And we did this both while walking, and we also did a video condition. So we also had people seated. Um, and, ex and using the keyboard to get around or just watching a video. So we also manipulated um, the proprioceptive information as well, the body-based cues. So our test was called the shortest route task. Um, and uh, basically what we did is we dropped people off at one of the objects in the maze, in this case, the rabbit statue. And so we dropped them off. And then we tell them to go to another object. In this case, we told them to go to the Earth. But uh, then we'd remove all the objects and replace everything with a red block. So now they had to get there, but they wouldn't necessarily know that they've reached the object they were looking for. They just had to go to the red block that they thought was the right one. So in this case, if this is correct, this is the Earth. Um, but um, so there wasn't really feedback. So we basically are testing their knowledge without, without information. Um, a savvy participant could learn a little bit, but most people um, don't learn too much during the testing. So we can really get a sense for how much they learned during that 10 minutes. And so what did we find um, was that um, overall, people who made decisions about where they wanted to explore did better than people who were guided. Um, and that was especially true in the walking condition. The video condition was a trending there, but not as much. Um, but overall, we saw this effect where people making decisions really, um, really um, plays a role in 
whether or not you're able to learn those connections between locations. Um, this is chance level um, here, so people were above chance on the whole, but still not 100%, so um, it is still a really difficult task. And indeed, um, what's most striking is that there's these huge individual differences. So some people um, are down here at chance, and some people are all the way at 100%. So what we did here is put everyone in order um, based on how good they did. Um, so the worst group is down here, the best people are here, um, both the free and, and guided walking groups. And as you can see, in both groups, there's people who are just terrible, um, and there's people who are great and can get everything right. Um, so it's not the case that even if you're guided, you can't bring something to, to the table and know where things are. Um, and even if you're given all the information, you still can be terrible. So um, what we see is this, the, the effect of the manipulation really happens in the middle, um, but we see a huge, huge individual differences overall. Um, and so that's something we're working on right now. And so um, just to give you a, a taste of what we're doing right now is um, looking at these individual differences in more um, direct uh, Directly. So this is just what we're doing right now in the scanner. So this is just a, a version of the task. I'm going to show you a video of, of what's happening in the scanner. Um, we basically made a, a non-walking version of this to put in the scanner. Um, but it's the same basic idea where people, um, now they just stop at each intersection and have to make a decision about where they want to go. This is the test phase. They've been asked to go to the umbrella. And now they have to uh, find the object that they think is the umbrella. Um, and so what we're doing is trying to figure out um, where in the brain, you know, how is this differing between individuals during the course of learning? So we're looking at these sort of communities of, of brain networks um, and how their learning trajectories differ across individuals. So um, when you're learning something and, you, and you're doing a good job at it, how, um, how is your learning trajectory different from those people who are not um, doing so hot? Um, in particular, looking at um, a circuit in the prefrontal cortex and hippocampus um, sort of interactions there and sort of thinking about um, this as a, as a key circuit. So we're hopefully, we don't have any data yet, but um, we're still collecting on this, but um, that's something where we're headed. And so you can see there in the scanner. <laughs> so, um, so we're looking at this, right? Do better navigators have greater connectivity between regions in the brain using fMRI? Um, we're also looking at this with EEG. Um, so we did basically the same study using um, uh, electroencephalography. Um, and so this is an overhead view of that maze. So it's similar to the one I showed you before with some slight modifications. Um, but again, we have several objects in alcoves and um, paintings on the wall, and, and people get around. But now we're actually doing it using EEG, where we're recording um, electrical signals um, in the brain. Um, and now we have the active and passive group. So we can do this um, active and passive manipulation for decision making, um, but now see what's happening. So um, our active group can make decisions at each corner, but the passive group just has to follow the, the, the arrow that we tell them to do. Um, and particularly, um, we're interested in um, a, a brain oscillation called theta. So oscillations are sort of um, these really important uh, uh, neural signals that are theorized to play a role in sort of setting dynamics for encoding and learning um, and thinking and sort of uh, synchronous communication between brain areas. So we're hoping to see this sort of signal of synchrony um, between sort of differing brain areas as they work together um, while people learn um, this maze. So, uh, so far, um, what we've seen so far is again, we see this free group versus the guided group against is starting to um, become different. We're again seeing these big individual differences um, between the groups and within each group. Um, and now we're seeing differences in theta. So just to orient you guys what this is, because it's kind of crazy, um, this is like an overhead view of someone's head. <laughs> and this is their nose, and these are their ears. And what we're looking at is this theta signal, which, which oscillates at 4 to 8 hertz. Um, and it's just this signal. Um, it's a certain frequency band. In the, of, of neural signals. Um, so the free group uh, has this theta signal um, very much in this sort of central prefrontal cortex area, which is where we were hypothesizing. Um, the, the guided group has a little bit, but not so much, but there's this big difference between these two. And this is just before 50 milliseconds before they make their choice point during the exploration. So when they're exploring, we think we have these, uh, each choice point has a, a discrete decision point. So we say, hey, are you, you're about to make a choice whether you want to turn left or right as you're exploring or go straight. 
And as they make that choice, just before that choice, um, we're seeing this difference. So the free group is doing something um, just before they make their choice. And we're seeing similar effects right at the choice point, um, um, also in the free group. And then sort of seeing some interesting stuff in the guided group um, in the more posterior area. So we might be seeing this sort of um, dissociation between these two systems, between being free to make decisions or what's happening in the guided group. So we're exploring that more. But these are sort of early data. Um, so just to summarize, um, we've seen that specific components of active learning might differentially contribute to spatial knowledge. Um, I didn't talk this to you, but in fact, we do find that active walking contributes to survey knowledge. So that's in contrast to our graph knowledge. So decision making actually didn't make any difference to graph knowledge, to survey knowledge, um, but walking made the difference. So we see, again, this sort of dissociation. And then in contrast, active decision making contributed to graph knowledge. Um, and then we also saw that there's this interesting prefrontal theta power um, is involved in active decision making. So we're starting to see, understand what's happening in the brain that underlies this sort of active advantage. And of course, we saw these individual differences in learning, so um, uh, huge, huge individual differences, and that's something we're looking at right now with fMRI. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about self-motion. So a lot of my work has been in less complicated environments um, and using something called path integration. So how do we track locations during path integration and sort of understanding this. And this could be important for understanding some of those metric information uh, for like a labeled graph, um, or if you are interested in doing survey knowledge, this might be important for it. So path integration is a continuous updating of position and orientation during movement in an environment. So we typically think of something like a desert environment. So this is actually something that my colleague sent me. Um, this is the salt flats in Botswana. Um, and uh, basically, they, they, somebody like stood 50 meters away or something, and then uh, someone else tried to just like, walk, like close their eyes and walk in a straight line and, and reach that person. And like hilarity ensued because uh, it turns out you can't do that very well. So even just walking in a straight line with your eyes closed is actually quite difficult. Um, you can try this yourself at home, or if you just think about going at night, right? If, if you're walking at night, um, you stumble into stuff. Um, so we're not amazing at path integration, um, but we're not random. So humans are above, certainly above chance when we do these sorts of things, but we're, um, our systems are pretty coarse. A lot of animals have really great path integration <coughs> systems, um, although they also rely on things like uh, polarization of the sun and other things. Um, so that's something that's um, intriguing, especially when we talk to an, an anthropology crowd, because um, there are sort of reports of some groups that can you know, path integrate really amazingly, but I'm not, you know, we don't know how true that is, um, or if it's particular to certain environments, right, to your own environment that you know, um, or whether or not it's actually um, something that is more universally human or not. And so that's an interesting question that you guys might have some insight on. Um, so we can talk about things like tracking a location. So if you go on a circuitous outbound path, can you take a straight line back to your, to your start? Um, when you do that, but it can also mean something as simple as tracking, um, you know, going in a straight line or rotating in place so we just know how far we rotate. Um, and so we can put those things together. So often we have, um, these are the more uh, simple environments and so sometimes our subjects come in and they're like, awesome, I'm gonna do a virtual reality study. This is so exciting. <laughs> and then we're like, sweet, uh, here's a hallway. Here's a desert with a pole in it. Uh, we're just going to have you walk around in that. So that's a little less exciting, um, but they're still pretty in into it. But maybe in the upcoming few years, as VR becomes more prevalent, they will not be as excited to do our studies. <laughs> so, um, so, that we, so now we're really stripping down a lot of that information. So it's a very different type of environment. And we're really trying to get people's self-motion cues, so not things like you know being able to see how far a wall is, because now you can you can. Uh, use other cues. You can use other visual cues to judge distances and things like that. Um, but here you really have to rely on just your self-motion. Um, and so just again to sort of highlight this, um, you know, path integration is the hallmark of survey knowledge. So if you really want to be able to know distances and angles between things, um, you really have to be able to do path integration. Um, but it's also important for things like the labeled graph. So if you want to just know whether or not this is about 90 degrees, um, you don't not need a really perfect system, but you might have a coarse system, which is what we have, right? So if we have sort of a somewhat, somewhat coarse system for path integration, you might be able to say, oh yeah, that was probably about like, that was like three meters, but maybe it was four, but you know, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter that much, but, um, but it was longer than, than this one. 
Um, so that might be sufficient for building up something like a labeled graph. Um, there's a bunch of brain stuff, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, there's a couple really important areas. So the hippocampus, which I've mentioned before, um, is really a big um, area for, for navigation in general, but path integration especially. Um, you may have heard of play cells. Um, that was part of winning the Nobel Prize a couple years ago. Um, those are in the hippocampus. And there's grid cells, which is another factor, which is an entorhinal cortex. And they sort of do different things. But these are sort of those, those sort of mapping tools um, in the brain that help um, help you um, locate your position. Um, so some key structures, retrospleno cortex as well, um, we'll be talking about. But I'm not going to go into this. If you want, there's sort of a little box and, box and wiring diagram. But again, um, uh, just to basically know there's a lot of complicated things happening here, a lot of dif different systems interacting. Um, so from the cognitive side, I just want to talk about some models of path integration. Um, so there's one model is called a configural model or maybe an accumulator model, where basically if you're doing a complicated outbound path, um, you're remembering this path. And at the end of the path, you need to get home. You do a little sort of like trigonometry, um, a little computation, and then figure out where you went home. So this requires you to remember the path itself um, and then do some computations at the end. So that's sort of one model. Um, another model is a homing vector model where you just keep track of where you are relative to home and then at the end you can make this final update. So you don't actually need to remember anything about the path, but you do need to make a constant update um, at every step. And so there's a lot more updating, um, but, uh, but then less sort of memory of the whole thing. So this is another sort of system that we might be able to use. And it's not necessarily clear which one we're, we're doing. So there's been some behavioral evidence that we can use either one if you're, if you're told to, say, use a you know, homing strategy or try to use the, remember the path um, if we need to. But um, most people have been really focused on this uh, configural model and accumulator model, so thinking about um, how do people encode each, each leg of the, of the journey. Um, but we're going to focus here a little bit more on the homing vector model um, and seeing whether or not there's some sort of signal in the brain that tracks your trajectory back to your home location, um, whether or not we can see something that's really saying, um, where are you relative to home? Um, so just a, a little note about a new, some methodology we have, um, loop closure. Um, we've developed a loop closure task because um, of the traditional task is called triangle completion. That's the sort of task that a lot of people have been using for path integration um, for many years. And triangle completion um, goes like this. You have a, two legs of an outbound path. You have to complete the triangle. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to explain it. Um, you go on a straight line. You turn in place. You go straight. And then the participant has to sort of make this trajectory. Um, so hopefully they do this. Uh, more likely they do this. Um, something out here. So again, something that's not random, but not, um, not great. Um, but what we don't know is then what is the source of error that happens here. So if people are making this, this error, is it because they didn't encode this outbound path correctly? That's possible. Is it because they didn't figure out the right computation? That's possible. Do they just like know where to go and then just like not execute it right? They just didn't turn the, the amount they needed to? So we don't really know where those sources of error are. Um, most people have assumed that, it's, that this error is in the encoding and that it's all based on, on what's, um, what we're learning about the outbound path. Um, we've found that that's not really true. So when we ask people to take the same turn, um, so like we rotate and then say, just return that and go parallel to that first path. Or do that same thing, but just go parallel, but in the opposite direction. Um, they actually do very different things. So even though the encoding angle is the same, their production is different, um, and they're actually finding very different er types of errors. So, um, so once we've controlled for the, the encoding, um, we actually find that um, these execution errors are quite substantial and might actually be contributing quite a bit um, to, to this. It's, it's also possible that's part of computational error. Um, but basically, um, we can't really make the assumption that it's all in the encoding of the outbound path. Um, and so because of that, we tried to find up some new, some new solutions and some new methods of, of testing this. And so we came up with something called loop closure, um, um, which is basically uh, very simple. You go in a circle. <laughs> so instead of doing this multiple steps of a triangle, um, now we just have people walking in a circle and basically tell us when you return to the place you started. So now you can just track this location. You can also track 
the shape of the circle as well, um, but now you're not actually producing anything special. Um, now it's all about whether or not you can just track that, that position. So we're removing some of that production step. And I'll talk you first through um, one that we did in the scanner, which is visual path integration. So we're doing this in the scanner, so they're not actually moving. Um, because you can't do that when you're using fMRI, you have to be very still. Um, so we're doing this purely visually, um, and the way we did it here was we showed them a video and then asked them whether or not the, the video ended in the same place it started. So maybe it only went part way around, maybe it went all the way around and passed, and those would be mismatches, but if it completed and ended in the same place it started, it was a match. Um, so I'm going to have you guys do this. You can try it yourself. It's very hard. Um, we do give people feedback uh, when they're learning it, um, so don't worry if, if you find it difficult. So you can try it. Get ready. Anyone? Same place? Different place? <laughs> it was actually the same place. It ended in the same place it started. The difference are also very different. So um, if it's an undershoot, um, you can usually uh, you can tell a little bit better. Um, we have different speeds and we have different size circles, so timing is not an issue. So people, like a very long one could still be an undershoot, a uh, very short one could still be an overshoot because we have, have speeds and things like that. Um, but um, as you can see, it's hard, right? We don't give you any landmarks. We have these trees there just for sort of optic flow purposes, but it's not really um, providing you as much information. So, um, but people are not random. People are better than chance, and in fact, um, we do also see that their brains are, are doing something too. Um, so as I said, we have circles and there's a nice, some nice properties about circles. So um, the property that we're um, banking on here is that as you move away from the circle, from this home location, your Euclidean distance gets bigger and bigger, but then it gets smaller and smaller. So you go further away and then you come back and you return and you come close. Um, so what we're looking for is signals in the brain that follow the same pattern, so that maybe increase and then decrease again. So looking for a sort of a sine wave. Um, and in fact, we found that. So we found several parts of the brain um, that were key parts that we were interested in, like the hippocampus and retrosplenial cortex and parahippocampal cortex, um, that all showed this sort of pattern that had this, this pattern of, uh, of increasing activity with increasing Euclidean distance from home and decreasing activity when you got closer. And again, we had several size circles, so it was not, uh, it wasn't about being at the 180 degree point, it was really about distance. So as you cross the different circles, um, 180 degrees is at different distances and things like that. Um, we also see it in some other parts of the brain as well. Um, so that was pretty exciting. So some evidence for um, a homing vector um, signal in the brain. Um, so we're really tracking this distance um, from home and it's consistent with this homing vector system. And again, it's, it's sort of different from how people have been thinking about it um, in terms of just sort of thinking about how far is each leg and sort of uh, computing and encoding each part and thinking more about tracking as a homing signal. We also saw lots of individual differences in, in this performance as well. Some people were at chance, some people were great. Um, what we found was that um, we saw differences in gray matter volume. So again, this idea of sort of bigger is better um, and that people who have bigger gray matter in some parts of the brain are going to be um, helpful, are gonna, is going to be useful to them. And this is, of course, corrected for total brain volume, and we add um, sex and age as, as a covariate. Um, so keep controlling for those factors. Um, we still see this retrosplenial cortex, hippocampus, and medial prefrontal cortex areas, um, which are all sorts, sorts of key parts of that network, um, all have larger gray matter volume if you do better at this task. So we're starting to see some evidence for, for that, for both structure. Um, and then um, a slightly more complicated idea um, is that um, is basically how does the brain work at rest? So not when they're doing a task, but when you're just kind of hanging out. Um, we do something called a resting state scan, which is just like seven minutes of you trying to stay awake, but think about whatever you want to do. So as your mind waters, there's these brain networks that sort of fluctuate in and out. One of them is called the central executive network, which is sort of these parietal areas, parietal and prefrontal areas that work together. It looks like this. Um, and what we found is that um, people who do better at this task have good connectivity uh, between this hippocampus and entorhinal cortex, again, some of these areas that we're interested in, and this central executive network um, when they're just hanging out at rest. So again, we're seeing not just the structural differences, but sort of these somewhat functional differences as well as your um, just sort of not doing a task, but just sort of intrinsically. What are the, what are the natures of these um, and how do they come about? We don't know, but 
um, we do see these differences, right? So that's something um, to think about. Again, we don't know if these are, um, you know, genetically determined, and, uh, socially constructed, any, you know, in any ways, but we do see differences. Um, just a quick note, we also found these sort of brain areas, um, going back to sort of functional differences here, um, thinking about uh, brain regions that track stuff. So again, hippocampus and retrospinal cortex are really involved in just tracking distance in a straight line. So not just in this homing vector signal, but just as you're moving forward in a straight line or rotating in place, we see a similar type of signal. So again, um, these areas seem to be tracking um, distance in some way and seem to be very flexible about what they're tracking. So it's um, a pretty interesting thing to think about. Okay, just to summarize this bit. Um, so we've talked about path integration, which is this updating of position and orientation um, during movement through an environment, and that seems to be very important. And we see some neural evidence for, homing, for a homing vector system um, for path integration, um, as well as for just encoding translation and, and rotation. Um, so again, we've seen some of these neural signals. Um, again, we've talked about path integration. Um, there's a bit of a tension between, you know, is path integration actually that important and useful for us? Um, and, uh, you know, if we, if we have sort of a graph system, um, but that's something that I think we're trying to figure out um, more of in the future. Okay, so just um, another part of path integration, sort of spatial learning and self-motion part two, um, I just want to quickly touch on an, another study that we're looking at, which is the sources of information involved in path integration, um, whether or not you're using visual information or body-based information, um, and what those cues might be, um, be doing. So um, I talked about this a little before, but I'll go into more detail now. Um, about some of the body-based cues that you might use. So again, when we talk about active learning, there's lots of different things. Um, this is not active. Um, optic flow information um, is passive, but it's information about how fast you're moving. So this is that sort of vection information, um, you know, the Star Wars kind of illusion, right, where you feel like you're moving because you see visual information moving past you, um, or if you're like sitting on the bus and the bus next to you starts to move, you feel like you're moving backwards because there's some visual information telling you that you're moving. Um, proprioception, again, information from the muscles and joints, right? So you don't have to see that. I know my arm is moving because I'm getting feedback um, from my proprioceptive system saying that my arm is moving even though I can't see it. I'm also giving a motor command to my arm. So um, I'm also getting the, that little a copy of that signal saying move your arm around. Um, so we get that too. And then um, your vestibular information, this is your inner ear um, uh, balance and rotation. So which is basically um, changes in speed and direction of movement um, that's centered in your inner ear. Um, so we tested a little bit this, this a little bit more thoroughly. So um, we are doing this loop closure test, but now we're doing it in a, in a walking setting, in a, in a large VR setting, because um, prior, you know, we, we were in the scanner, but we didn't really um, get to test it more thoroughly. We just said, like, did you end in the same place or not? Um, there's a lot of questions about that. And of course, in the scanner, you're sitting still, so you can't test this question about um, different types of information. So what we did is we had some people, so we had everyone do um, four different conditions. Um, you could either walk with vision, in which case we have this lovely desert environment, uh, with our start pole just to tell you where, where the places that you're trying to track, which disappears once you walk into it. Um, but you know, basically we just you know, have optic flow information from the texture on the ground and self-motion cues from walking. We also have um, a wheelchair with vision. So we do the same thing, but in a wheelchair, so that removes your proprioceptive information and motor efference. Um, we cannot, in a uh, ethically uh, uh, good manner, separate your motor efference from your uh, proprioception. Um, that involves sort of cutting certain neuro neurons. Uh, we also can't really um, remove your uh, vestibular system also <laughs> in an ethical manner either. Um, then we have a no vision condition, which is basically the same thing, but uh, we show you the start pole, but everything else is black. So once you walk into the start pole, you don't see anything. So you're just walking, um, but without any visual information. Um, and then you do the same thing with a wheelchair. And so that's just your vestibular system telling you where you are. And so our task is similar to what I showed you before, where people are tracking their home location. But here now we have our, our research assistant takes you by the elbow and just walks you around. And then you tell us when you think you've made one complete circle. So now it's just up to you to tell us when you've stopped, once you think you've returned to home. And we have several different size circles again. So we can test these questions of circle size, um, some fillers um, as well. And this is what it looks like in our lab. <laughs> 
So you'll see two different eyes here because it's the left and the right eye, um, but they show basically the same stuff because it's a desert. It's not very exciting. So this is what a participant is seeing. And then here's what they're actually doing. They're walking around. And our research assistant is, is walking them, and then now they've just clicked the mouse to say that they think they've returned to the place they've started. Um, so um, again, it's a difficult task, but um, people are above chance and things like that. So again, we can do this um, with and without vision in a wheelchair um, and so forth. So our primary um, measure of interest is position error. Oh, we have others we can talk about if you're interested. And that's just the straight line distance between um, the start from where they, the start location and the home location, which is where they should have been, and the place that they said they, they thought the home location was, right? So they can be really anywhere, um, but wherever they click the mouse to say that they thought they returned back to the start. <sighs> Um, one thing we don't know necessarily about it is whether or not they, it was an undershoot or an overshoot because um, you know you could go all the way past, so your position error could be on either side. It's not signed. Um, I do have that information if you want to see, though. Um, one thing to note is that we have three levels of chance because we have three different size circles. Um, so if you're um, if you know, if you're in the same place but in a bigger circle, your position error is going to be bigger because you're like there's just more places to get further away. Um, so um, one thing to note is the wheelchair with no vision, so this is vestibular only, is no different than chance. So just using your vestibular system actually doesn't do anything for you, at least in our paradigm. Um, our walking with vision condition is much better than everything else, but actually our two other conditions are about the same. Um, and this is true um, sort of with, with all of our different ways of looking at it. Um, we find that we do see a substantial contribution of walking with vision, having both of those cues combined, um, but the two other cues actually make a pretty equal contribution. Um, so they're really basically having vision or having proprioception make about an equal contribution. If you have neither, you're pretty terrible and at chance. So um, again, vestibular system doesn't seem to do very much in this task, but walking and um, having visual information is about equal. Um, interestingly, um, our self-report measures show a different, di different um, sort of thing, such that when people, we ask people how difficult the different tasks were, um, very easy task walking with vision, they said the, the things with vision were pretty easy, the things without vision were very hard. Um, but this is actually very, this is different from our, our actual results. So from a, a self-report point of view, people really think they rely on vision, but actually they rely on vision and um, proprioception about equally. Um, so your subjective ratings don't match the actual task data. Okay, so um, just to summarize here, we found that visual information and proprioceptive information contribute about equally to path integration, um, but that pure vestibular information is really no better than chance. Um, and these differ actually from some previous work on tri from triangle completion. So again, we're using a different task, and so we can explore this a little bit more um, uh, in terms of what they might mean. Okay. So I want to uh, wrap up here with uh, a new task that we're just starting to collect data on. Um, so I don't have any too much data to show you, but I can tell you a little bit about the task because I think it's pretty exciting. Um, looking at um, these differences um, in both between individuals and then looking at sort of groups. So um, one thing that happens is we've seen a lot of sex differences in navigation. You may know about this. Um, but what are the source of these sex differences? And so that's something we're thinking about. Um, another thing we're thinking about is what happens to our navigation abilities as we age. So as people get older, um, many systems start to decline, but um, what happens in particular with navigation? Um, and in particular, what we're interested in is what changes happen during menopause, um, because um, there's huge changes in sex hormones. So just some things to consider out, sort of walking through the logic of this. Um, we've seen huge differences in sex uh, between men and women. Uh, they're frequently observed, although not everywhere. We have, in almost many of the data I've showed you, have sex differences, but not all of them. The path integration data does less so than, say, the, the, the maze learning data. Um, but what are the sources of those, right? Um, are they biologically based? Are they based on sex hormones? Are they based on uh, you know, other developmental differences? Are they based on social socialization and other things? Right? We don't really know the nature and the, the cause and understand underlying uh, nature of these sex differences. Um, and then sort of on the other side, navigation has emerged as this early marker for um, detecting uh, risks of dementia. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, 
it's a, an early wandering and disorientation is an early sign of Alzheimer's um, and part of the aging process. And so um, this could be um, important. And women have twice the risk for dementia than men, right? So there's differences in, in how men and women um, age in terms of their dementia and memory. We also know that sex hormones are, are a huge factor in influencing the organization of the hippocampus um, in different ways. Um, and as I mentioned, the hippocampus is a really important um, aspect of learning and memory, both for navigation and just in general. So um, it's a real strong target um, for estrogen especially. Um, and then, of course, there's these sweeping changes of sex hormones during menopause. And so, you know, what's going to happen as you uh, make this menopausal transition? Um, so, to, you know, so bringing these together, we really want to find out whether or not this midlife decline in sex hormone production in women um, is going to be associated with brain changes, and is it going to be changed, um, especially in the hippocampus, and then is that going to be associated with decreased navigation ability? Um, especially since things like, uh, you know, there's going to be reduced estrogen, are women going to look more like men? In which case, would they get better? <laughs> because, um, you know, men have had better uh, spatial skills, but at the same time, memory is declining. Uh, less estrogen is sort of worse for memory, so maybe there'd be some declines um, in that set. So putting this together with um, some colleagues at UCSB um, who do this, I have a colleague who works on uh, menopause in, in sort of normal aging, um, and then uh, with another navigation person and also with anthropologist Steve Gollin is also involved with this, um, we're testing this out. So we've got the same task, so we've got this loop task that I showed you before and the maze task um, here, and then we have a third task um, which is more about looking at strategies, um, whether or not people take following known routes or whether they take um, new new routes to get to the place they want. So if they're going to take the same, the known route that they've learned um, to reach a, a target or whether they'll make a, say, a new shortcut, um, which have shown a lot of sex differences. So men tend to take the shortcuts. Women take the, tend to take the, take the known route. Although recently we've also seen that uh, they, women can take the shortcut. They just choose to take the, take the known route. Um, so again, looking at these differences between here. Um, so we're going to have, we have pre-peri and post-menopausal women and chronologically age-matched men, as well as younger adults. So we can look at both chronological and reproductive aging here. Um, so um, watch this space. We haven't quite, uh, you know, it's a work in progress, but I think it'll be pretty exciting. Okay, so just to wrap up um, uh, some conclusions overall, you know, throughout the talk, I've shown you different ways of thinking about navigation and how we understand a new space, um, both from the sort of cognitive perspective and thinking about uh, different cognitive processes, as well as how the brain works. Um, we talked about path integration, and it's important for survey knowledge. Uh, we talked about graph knowledge and how you actively learn graph knowledge. Um, but more importantly, I just, um, really want to talk about uh, taking this sort of synthetic approach between sort of the neuroscience and the cognition side. Um, and so we can think both about the behavior um, that's involved, but then how um, the brain is doing that and really thinking about um, the interaction between these systems and thinking across multiple levels um, in general. So again, just, uh, you know, here are the questions that we talked about today. Uh, a lot of different questions and um, again, thinking of all ranging from sort of you know, very basic path integration, walking in a straight line um, to more complex things like a graph, um, and then thinking about how individuals differ um, throughout, you know, these individual differences, sex differences, and so forth. Um, so um, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. And these are, these are my collaborators at different places, so thank you to them as well. So are there any questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, very interesting. Um, I have a question about the, or two, two part question about mm -hmm. the individual differences. So, do you know how closely related people's abilities to do this, these very, mm -hmm. uh, you know, complicated and, and somewhat, you know, realistic tasks, how closely those are related to people's ability to do the much simpler rotation tasks that are on IQ tests? And yeah. Then, and then part B mm -hmm. would be whether these abilities, do they load on? G, or are they something independent from G? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and that's something we don't totally know yet, but that's something we're trying to figure out. Um, so there have been a few studies looking at um, these sort of small-scale mental rotation tasks, which is sort of how we do it. Um, so I have some collaborators like at the Army, and they are basically like, we have one test for spatial abilities, and it's this like mental rotation test. Um, 
and it's that's that's not really the same thing. <laughs> so um, so there's some evidence suggesting that there's differences between these small scale and the large scale abilities. Um, we don't necessarily know quite how they map on to each other. We don't really know how they map onto things like path integration because that hasn't been looked at yet. And we don't necessarily know how that maps onto other abilities like general fluid intelligence or um, other working memory capacity and other things too. So we think they're probably related. Um, one thing that is interesting is that um, you know these individual differences. The individual I'm showing you are people at like you know Brown University undergrads, <laughs> like Bowdoin College undergrads, right? So these are very motivated, very bright young people. Um, uh, they often show frustration. It's not just that they're not interested. They're you know they want to get this right <laughs> and they just can't. Um, so so it's not necessarily the case that. Uh, you know, everyone who's just, you know, just has general, great general intelligence is going to be good at this. Um, there's clearly something more, and it seems to be somewhat independent, but we don't necessarily know what that is um, yet, yeah, and so that's something we're trying to work on. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I have sort of a related question. I was curious if you or others looked at like, how these results, even the individual different results, may generalize to like different spatial scales of navigation, like if you're navigating. Mm -hmm. Planning a really long journey or trip, yeah. um, the kinds of input that might be available to you might not wouldn't be the same, I guess, as navigating within a room where you right. can walk around and get the feedback. Yeah, no, that's something that again we don't really know that much about. Um, you know, even just again from just sort of like the the object rotation versus a room scale is something we don't know that much, and then really that connection between these bigger, much bigger scales. I mean, so navigational scale as a as a geographic concept is a pretty big, um, but then sort of thinking about relating that to like maybe map reading and planning and and doing things like that is like kind of another level that hasn't really been looked at yet. Yes. Uh, related to that, I was wondering. Um, I can imagine that many of your participants have quite some experience with using things like Google Maps and mm -hmm. reading maps in general. Um, and I was wondering whether you have any information on uh, differences with, between those kind of particip participants and people that do not have much experience with Yeah, um, we have a self-report questionnaire that at that asks about their sort of spatial abilities. And like one question is about like whether or not they like to look at maps and use maps or are good at maps. Um, but we don't really know. Um, we ask other things. We ask about video game use. So that's something people ask about a lot. So whether or not um, there are differences with video game experience. Um, sometimes there are. Um, there are some brain differences. But it's also difficult to say whether or not you know, which direction that correlation goes in for things like that, whether or not they sort of, they like to look at maps and they like to play video, these types of video games because they're good at it or if they become good at it because they do it. Um, so, um, but we don't have a lot of information on their sort of um, how much they use stuff. I do have some, some uh, anecdotes, one of the grad students in, in, in a, another lab in my department was like showing people a map of something for, for one of her studies and she and the students were like, oh I have never used a paper map before. So now <laughs> right, students have like have no longer used a paper map. Um, and often, you know, as as people grow up more in, in sort of you know become or digital natives and have GPS always, um, you know, people our age might have you know, at least I had to have figured out something on a map before. A lot of people growing up now don't, and so that's going to be a really interesting transition, and we'll just see what happens there. Hi, um, this is super interesting. Uh, I had some questions about the fMRI data. Mm -hmm. um, basically, uh, you had mentioned that in the active versus the guided conditions, there were sort of differences in the neural systems that were, were being recruited. Mm -hmm. Did you find that performance, you know, across the sort of rank order mm -hmm. individuals was correlated with, you know, the extent of activation of those networks that were appropriate for right. the two different tasks? That's, and if not, yeah. um, you know, because you could see it as either like failure to recruit or differential recruiting mm -hmm. different systems. So did you have evidence for one or the other of these types of patterns? Yeah, that's that's great. That's, that's actually like the analysis we're running like next week. <laughs> so so we haven't done it yet. Um, so right now we've just been looking at the group differences. So that was the EEG data, I think. 
um, between the active and passive. Um, and um, we're, we're going to be running the individual differences part next. Yeah, so we're actually looking at them probably separately because it may be the case that even if you're passive and doing well, you might be recruiting something different from an active person doing well because you're sort of task, task differences, so you might have a different trajectory. Uh, but we, have, we, we think we are going to see some differences, but we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I was just wondering whether you could speak a little bit to like the development of this system. Um, like, for instance, uh, you were talking about the hippocampus, parahippocampus, and these, these brain regions mm -hmm. that seem to be involved in, in these different navigation systems. And um, I would think that their sort of critical phase of development is, for the most part, prenatal. But mm -hmm. like, to what extent are those brain regions still maturing yeah. in early life, mm -hmm. at, like sort of alongside the maturation of these systems? And yeah. like, do, do infants or children mm -hmm. during development progress through some of those navigation styles that you were Yeah, that's a really in? interesting question. I don't know that much about develop, brain development, um, but I do know things that, so for example, prefrontal cortex and all these other parts develop later. So, um, so some of these systems are gonna come on more, maybe more when you're a teenager to a young adult. Hippocampus tends to be, you know, as an older system, sort of its deeper evolutionary roots, um, but it's still developing um, throughout. And so things like, you know, children, they, you know, they still know where things are in the house, right? They can like, they know where the snacks are, you know, and things like that. So, um, so even pretty young kids, but there's, it's still developing that. So, but I don't necessarily know the systems. There hasn't been that much on development. Um, and sort of navigational abilities in young children. Um, a lot of it has focused on um, this question of a geometric module um, and whether or not, um, so like if you have a, re a rectangular room, um, you know, the two, these two corners and these two corners are sort of rotationally equivalent. Um, and so whether or not children get confused by the geometry or if you have like a, a, like a red wall, if that's a cue that will help them. And so there's like, they you know can do this in mice and like uh, chicks and other things, um, but that's really been the main focus of a lot of this has been looking at like sort of geometry versus features, um, but really not much beyond that. So there's a lot of room to explore um, development. There's been a few few studies, but not that much. And have you investigated whether uh, performance can be improved through training? That's something we want to do. Um, um, we're hoping to try to do that's sort of the that's sort of the holy grail I think um, whether or not we can help these people who are really you know at the at the bottom of that spectrum um, and also you know. understand how much of it is innate and right how, how exactly much. yeah if, he, if people are just kind of told some strategies and things like that will that be helpful to them um, we've got a, a study planned uh, for maybe in a couple of years we're going to try to do a little bit but but it's uh, you know, what you really want is like a targeted personalized training. So some people might be good at certain things and other people might be good at other aspects. Because it's such a complicated system and there's really, you know, like a dozen different factors involved. So it may be, you know, the people who are best have all those different factors, but maybe there's just one or two critical ones that would be useful or maybe you have to kind of help with everything. So we don't really know, for any individual who's not good at it, what aspect they're not good at yet. And so we really need to figure that out so we can do, do that. Um, we can sort of figure out a few generalized training regimens, but not a lot has been done, been very successful on it, and it's something we'd like to do. Mm -hmm. I think this kind of links that question with Renee's earlier question, but so if the kind of navigation that we're doing now is less life or death oriented than it is mm -hmm. in other places where you have to be, right. to use that navigation right. to get food and be able to get home for the night, and you mm -hmm. don't want to be left out in the forest by right. yourself or something like that, right? Then you would, I would think, expect that if you looked at adults that you would, you would not see the, the same range of individual differences that you see. So assuming mm -hmm. that there is some learning that's mm -hmm. going on, right, that it would be much more crucial to actually do that learning. Mm -hmm. And so when you actually looked at the adults, you wouldn't see the same range that mm -hmm. you see in undergraduates. Right, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, at to what point, I mean, undergraduates are, you know, sort of adults, but like versus maybe different cultures, I think you would certainly see those differences. But again, to the extent that 
navigation is really important, but again, it may be dependent on your particular, the particular cues you're using in your area and what you might be able to do. Yeah, you want to do it with people who are like full-time foragers. Right, right, exactly. So, and there's been, a, you know, a little bit, but not, not a lot. So, um, it's a fun area to explore. So, triangle completion as a strategy for closing mm -hmm. the loop, did you say that that's a difficult problem in robotics? Oh, so loop closure is a difficult problem, yeah, so... But not specifically the triangle. Yeah, not just so. specific, but basically robots can't find, don't know when they've returned to the place they've started. So which could be, it could be important for triangle completion as well. But loops, so basically robots don't have great systems and they can't correct. So like if we had a system where if we're going around somewhere and then we get, you know, our, our path integration system is a little bit coarse, but then we see a landmark and then we can sort of re-update and say, oh, okay, I'm back where I'm supposed to be. I can sort of make those corrections. Robotic systems can't do that quite as well. Um, they have some, but they can't always recognize the landmark if it's coming from a different place, from a different angle and things like that. Um, so some of their systems are not working as well. So we've had some uh, so some of this was inspired by robotics work because we had collaborators who were like, robots can't even make a circle. Um, and so we wanted to see whether or not humans could even do that too. Mm -hmm. Are there any differences in individuals that have grown up in like city, urban environments versus individuals who go to kind of rural, more farm environments? Um, I think so, but I don't know if we've studied it, um, but sort of anecdotally, yes. Um, I know some people who were who were saying, you know, who again were were basically saying, oh yeah, I can always tell a country boy because they know how to read a ridge line and like where things are versus like a city person, like if you're or doing orienteering or something, um, because and they just city people just can't do some of that as well. Um, so I think there certainly are going to be differences, but we don't really know what those are. Um, interestingly, someone was telling me about. Um, a couple studies, so, there, so there's a group at Utah, so Elizabeth Cashdan, and then collaborators in, in psychology, Sarah Krumerger and uh, Janice Stefanucci are doing a cross-cultural study. So one, they were looking at some people in Italy, in like Venice, which is like a crazy thing, versus some other city, which I can't remember, maybe it was Milan or something that was a little more gridded. And then actually, I heard this earlier, they actually looked at Salt Lake City, which is like a perfect grid, and in fact, it's labeled such, so your address is actually like 100 north, 50 west, or something. It's like actually very, like addresses are on grids too. And so people in those different environments and, and seeing the differences. And so, you know, people in the, in the, in the sort of two more structured environments were, were better at doing things that people in structured environments need to do. Um, and we're better at maybe knowing the sort of cardinal directions but we're not as great at like finding sort of these complicated routes, whereas the people in Venice, we're not as good at some of the other things, but we're real, much better at being able to like meander and find their way in different environments. So there is something there, but it's still pretty early on in that process. Anything else? Yes. Um, so I guess one, one thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is do you have like any intuitions about sort of the difference or how dissociable spatial spatial memory is from navigation within a space that you have not yet sort of memorized? Because mm -hmm. I, I was thinking sort of about like you know like the cab driver study and mm -hmm. one cab driver study, and um, you know I don't know how much of that was like only those who were good at it made it to that stage mm -hmm. versus, you know, there being training effects or whatever, but um, I was thinking about sort of like homing in a place where, in a, in a, with a population that all have the same degree of, or, you know, presumed the same degree of memory for the space right. versus, you know, simultaneously having to learn the space and also do navigation right. in that space. Right, so, so there's this famous study about London cab drivers, um, which you're talking about, which is basically London cab drivers go undergo this like two-year training course, and it's very rigorous, and they have to be able to basically say, go from, you know, 1500, whatever, some random address to some other place and be able to navigate it, and they take a test, and it's a whole thing. So, um, and they don't use GPS for this. So they have to basically have the entire map of the city of London memorized and know where everything is. Um, and people, they do this quite well. They have bigger hippocampi. Um, 
at this. Um, but again, it's like, are these people who are great at it anyway? So if you took a London, so your, maybe your question is, if you take a London cab driver, stick them in Detroit or something, right? Are they going to be better at doing this than you know someone from you know L.A. Yeah, yeah some yeah, just like random like person that. off the street. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's an interesting question. I mean, I would guess that they've been trained in their abilities, but again, I don't know if it's because they've been training for years and years to do this, or right. if they were sort of better yeah. already. I mean, it's probably a mix, but um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.